e che anche il Papa, per esercitare il potere, deve entrare sempre più in quel servizio che ha il suo vertice luminoso sulla croce. Several hospitals invite him to go visit, but he always chooses the place where there's the greatest pain. Sometimes he would call at half past five or six in the morning. As part of the daily planning, he would say, Pancho, listen, I'm doing a washing of the feet ceremony on Holy Thursday. I'm going to the hospital you invited me to, but let's make sure there's not a lot of media around. He always wanted to keep a low profile. We went to the Borda Hospital, which is a small neuropsychiatric facility that houses about 100 male inmates who've committed a crime and have a psychiatric disorder. He came in, as usual, with his briefcase, his humility, and washed the feet of 12 convicts there. We were doing our spiritual exercises for eight days in the Colegio Maximo. As Jesuits, we have them once a year. I was still a student, not yet a priest. In the middle of the retreat, he told me, you are comfortable here. You pray, you eat, you sleep all night. But in front of the college, you will see a woman, a mother of five with no house, who lives on the street. Leave the retreat and go find her. Better yet, find her a house and then come back and pray. So he basically kicked me out, at least temporarily. I couldn't go back to the Colegio Maximo until the family was cared for. And that's what happened. Well, I will never forget that. The challenge may sound too demanding, but it had a huge impression on us. It's not an improvised experience. It's very real, and I lived it. The Alameda Foundation came about from a neighborhood meeting. Its fundamental mission is to fight all forms of slavery and marginalization. So basically, sexual exploitation or enslavement for working purposes or child labor. We wrote him a letter to meet him because we thought the issues he talked about in his homilies coincided with what we were denouncing. Exposing the abuse was dangerous for the whistleblowers and for our own organization. Bergoglio immediately put himself at our service. In fact, he organized and celebrated a mass the following month. In the homily, Bergoglio strongly criticized the state's passive attitude towards the increase of the slave trade and child labor. There were people who had just been freed after being kidnapped, or others who had risked their lives. He would always meet with them, looking for ways in which they could be helped. In some cases, he housed some people himself while they waited for an official shelter. Sometimes, Bergoglio even found it helpful to have pictures taken of himself and some of us who were risking our lives. In our foundation, we have associates who are Catholics. Others are atheists, agnostics, or belong to other religions. But all of them love him because he is a person who preaches through example. He's a person who supports the poor and lives his life just like them. The truth is that we miss him a lot here because it wasn't unusual for us to call him on the phone so he could help us solve a lot of issues regarding the tide of complaints we're getting all the time. For him, poverty is not just a lack of material resources. He is also concerned with spiritual poverty. Talking about poverty in Argentina means talking about the slums, known as Villas Miseria. They are marginalized and disadvantaged areas where immigrants and the poor usually live. They quite possibly have the highest drug and crime rates in Argentina. In a slum known as Villa 21, Father Lorenzo de Vedia has his parish, one of the most visited by Cardinal Bergoglio. Bergoglio followed our slum, Villa 21, very closely. 
He was up to date on what our Kakupe parish was doing. Yes, he would visit once a month. He would accompany people through our halls, including families who were active in the parish. He always did this in a humble way. We would sometimes bump into each other on the subways or buses. Cardinal Bergoglio was determined to fight the spiritual poverty of these Buenos Aires neighborhoods. He built new churches and assigned many priests to take care of the people there. The villas stopped being reserved for just some of the priests. They became a place where all priests from Buenos Aires could go. He sent many priests to the slums. He always visited them and always went there to celebrate Mass. We were at Mass in one of the slums on December 8th. It was challenging because of the sheer number of parents whose children were about to receive their first communion. Suddenly, someone got down from bus number 46 in the Avenida Perito Moreno stop, right in front of the slum. We saw him coming towards the entrance and we asked, who is that? You see, it's very difficult for people from outside the slum to come in, especially alone. Our priest welcomed him and introduced him to us as Father Jorge. Later on, we found out he was a cardinal and the head of the church in Argentina. I went to spiritual retreats with him many times. He gave us talks, he showed us around, he listened to us. Once in Luján, he heard my confession. It was after we took part in a pilgrimage from Lumbier to Luján. I think that all of this, the familiarity he had and still has with the most humble neighborhoods, the slums, allowed him to learn a lot from the poor. When he visited the school, he taught me something. I'd been working there for 10 years. He taught me how to preach efficiently. He grabbed the microphone and walked up to the six, seven, eight-year-old girls there. He told me, if you can explain this to children, the message will get across to them and the adults. We delivered the daily newspaper to him, but sometimes he wasn't there. At the entrance of his residence, there's a small gated reception, so to prevent him from bending over to grab the paper, we would roll it up with a rubber band and leave it in the place for him. At the end of the month, he would give us the 20 rubber bands he had saved. It's those type of actions. We would tell him, Cardinal, this isn't worth anything. He would tell us, but it's part of your job, it's part of your labor, so I'm not going to throw it out. It's little things like that, small details that define the person. When my wife was expecting a baby, I met him one morning. I told him it would be an honor for me if he would baptize my newborn. He told me it wasn't a problem, and we agreed on a date. The baby was born June 9th, but he had a lot of engagements that day. He had a Corpus Christi celebration, and after that he had other things to do. But he found time for me. He baptized my baby the morning of June 9th in the cathedral here in Buenos Aires. I met him 20 days before he left for Rome. I knew about his trip and asked him what I should do about his subscription. He told me to keep delivering it, for he would be back in 20 days. That's what I did. I delivered it even during the conclave. 
Then he was elected, and it was a type of revolution in my house because we were all really excited. I delivered the newspaper until the end of March. We were waiting to see what arrangement the courier would decide on. One day before his inauguration mass, it was a Monday. He called me all the way from Rome. He asked me to cancel his newspaper subscription, and he also thanked me for my service all these years. In Argentina, as well as being the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Cardinal Bergoglio was president of the Argentinian Episcopal Conference. It was a responsibility he exercised with great care. Now as Pope, many world leaders want to meet him to ask him for advice and support. Dilma Rousseff, president of Brazil, is one of them. The advice Francis gave her is a key to understanding his style of government. <laughs> When he was educating novices, they had endearing nicknames for him, like Irma la Dolce, gloves of silk, hands of iron. That's really how he is, very tender, extremely loving, very understanding, but also very firm. The kind of this is how it is mentality, that hasn't changed. He was a man of dialogue. But when it came to making decisions, he was very firm. Without a doubt, he always analyzes what he says and what he does. But once he does something, it's because he is completely convinced it had to be done. Solamente el corazón de ustedes, mamás, sabe y puede hablarnos de lo que es una tragedia. Y por eso yo quisiera decirle a esta ciudad tan preocupada por muchas cosas que mire con corazón de madre porque la ciudad también es madre a estos hijos que ya no están y que llore it caused great sorrow. It was a huge sorrow for Argentina. And Jorge took charge of the pain. He couldn't take charge of the solution, but in this way he took charge of the people's sorrow so that they would feel better. And if a priest doesn't do that, then who should? He is a firm and demanding man, especially with himself. He lives a disciplined life at work, when he rests, and in prayer. He gets up at half past four and starts praying for two, maybe three hours. He prays every single day. He is a man of profound prayer. It's true, he dedicates a lot of time to prayer. In fact, we as priests had a telephone number that only we knew about. If we called him between 5 and 7 a.m., he would personally answer our calls. I am sure that the foundation and the source of all his spirituality and his actions are based on an encounter with God. Bergoglio is a man of poverty. He is a man who promotes prayer. He is always inviting us, asking us to pray for him. It's not a gimmick. He is very sincere. In fact, throughout the years, he continues to ask for our prayers. He has many virtues that can be found in the gospel. Simplicity, 
humbleness, piety. At the same time, an extremely strong Christian engagement in society, which is another great value found in the gospel. Something he strongly regretted, which he actually talks about in the book. I still remember it because the way he described it struck me. He talks about an incident where he leaves a young man waiting for a confession, just for a few minutes though. He decides to take care of other matters and leaves. The young man was under psychiatric medication. He left him waiting there for another priest. Bergoglio thought, he won't even notice. He goes out of the cathedral, walks about 150 feet or so, and he asks himself, what am I doing? Before anything else, I'm a pastor of souls. So he decides to go back to hear his confession. He then goes on to do all the things he had to do that day. He took the train, which he thought he would miss, but it was delayed. So he took the train and at night he went to confession. So the question is, what did he confess about? If he did in fact go back? I think he confessed about those minutes where he wasn't very clear on his mission. That was his confession, his regret. It was clear that his mission always has to be present in his life. When he forgot about that, even though it was just a few minutes, he deeply regretted it. Understanding Bergoglio's journey and his past are key to understanding his papacy. As a Jesuit, he combines a strong loyalty to the church with a dynamic creativity to solve problems. Cardinal Bergoglio wasn't afraid of innovation. He launched a TV show with one of his country's leading Jews, Rabbi Abraham Skorka. I would have never agreed to this show, and he would have never sat down with me if both of us weren't firm on who we are. We are two men with strong convictions in our traditions, in our life views. Our traditions and opinions have something in common, something that calls us to immerse ourselves in life to offer something, a commitment to help our neighbors, to help them, so together we can find a path of justice, good, and mercy. This can help us reach a new dimension of dialogue with God. That's why we have this meeting. That's why we wrote this book. He is a man who is able to relate not only with Catholics, but rather with all human beings, regardless of their religion or philosophical beliefs. He is well acquainted with other points of view, with other religions. He wants to look for a common ground we all share, a range of shared values that allows us to work together. mandara otros pastores que salieran a buscar. ¿Y esos pastores son los curas? Sí. ¿Son las monjas? ¿Son los obispos? ¿Son ustedes? Sí, otra vez, ¿son ustedes? Otra vez, más fuerte. Me decía, mira... He told me, look, the church isn't here to control people's lives, but to direct them to give them a chance to serve the gospel. That's why sometimes things get a bit out of hand. I came to discover that his comment, his advice, was extremely wise. He wants to evangelize, he wants to reach everyone, all backgrounds. That's why he was always trying to do new things at a pastoral level. He allowed me to carry out two initiatives that were very innovative. On the one hand, he approved the submarine way of the cross in Puerto Madryn. This year will be the 10th time we celebrate the submarine way of the cross in Puerto Madryn. Last year, we had 75 divers and 3,000 people on the shore and on the docks. 
All of them were following the celebration. The other thing is that he allowed me to work in the racing club at Avellaneda and also with the soccer team. In the racing club, I was working in management. That was, of course, under his authorization. He liked the idea of a simple priest out on the stands with the people enjoying the game, someone who could also be a shepherd on the soccer field with the team. It was during one of his weekly general audiences on Wednesdays. He saw us and immediately recognized us. The first thing he asked me was if we were going to do well or not. He made the gesture with his thumb up or down. When we told him we were going to do well, he said that gave him peace of mind. He told me he would visit the stadium with his father back in 1946, when he was nine. And he remembered the team, especially the goal that Pontoni scored. He made a hand gesture, tack, 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 mimicking how the player received the passes and then scored. The strange thing is that he's not just an average San Lorenzo fan, but he's more of a fanatic supporter. He is well aware of the team's daily activities. For the players, this is key. They see this as something that's extremely important. We manage a team that has more than 4 million fans, but one of its greatest fans is someone who leads a church with more than 1 billion faithful. People are attracted to Jorge Bergoglio's style. His election has caused a global outpouring of excitement.